everybody. Thank you for joining us for this talk. Um, the talk today will be in two parts. And the, the first part will be about the pen, which I will do a demonstration of, and then it will be followed by the letter, which Maria will demonstrate to you. So to begin with, I think that it's important just to give a little bit overview of the Ottoman tradition. It's going to be very brief because we're focusing mainly on the technical aspect. So the, the art of Ottoman calligraphy is based on the Arabic alphabet. <coughs> and what differentiates it is that it's uh, the aesthetic value of the letters. It is not Turkish in origin, and um, is referred to as Hushnahat, as beautiful writing. We have, uh, the tradition uh, dates back 10 centuries, but its roots are in religion. So we have the, the, uh, the Abbasid and Umayyad period, etc. And they developed calligraphy to new heights, but then the Ottomans came through and they really elaborated it. Um, the main reason for this was that they wanted to express the beauty of the world. We have a genealogy tree which documents the, the, the Ottoman school, which is about 500 years, and it's an unbroken chain. The, the, the chain, the, what is really important about it is that there's a student-master relationship that developed the art of calligraphy. And within this process, we have um, a lot of masters, great masters that came through. And eventually, we come to today's tradition. And if we just go back to the genealogy tree, we see what, it, what is great about that is that it started with the Ottoman school, but it's spread out to uh, across the world now, into America, Europe, etc. So we have here um, some some basic meshes are from the Ottoman period, we, and that's just really a, a very brief overview because we would like to concentrate on the technical aspects <coughs> of uh, how to prepare the pen, etc., and introduce the tools and materials. So we have a, the traditional. And um, this one was actually cut by Hassan Moja, who was my master. So basically, um, the reed in its original format looks something like this. And then once you've cut it into a reed column, you have this beautiful column here. And there's various reeds that we use for calligraphy. So you have the traditional reed column which is um, found in uh, warm climates, in marshes, etc. And then you have um, the bamboo, which is readily available everywhere. You have the java kalam, which is um, it, it's a thorn, it's a palm thorn native to Indonesia. And the way that the Ottomans discovered this was through pilgrims. Uh, and basically you cut the uh, column that you insert it into a smaller column so that it doesn't, um, you have a stronger grip in how you use it. And this was favored for smaller scripts in calligraphy, which we'll discuss later, because uh, it was so hard. Then you have these columns which are already made. Um, they can be made from bamboo or wood. And the, the purpose of these columns, you know, uh, sometimes you want to write large scripts and uh, you're able to have that flexibility of uh, having larger columns. So those, those are the basic columns that we use. The other tools that we have is this porcupine spur, and it's really to mix the ink. And the ink is... Um, poured into a glass jar or a cer ceramic jar. We have something called the lika, which is raw seal, and this is placed inside the, the glass jar. And the purpose of the lika is that it controls the amount of ink and it also <coughs> um, avoids overspills, etc. And there's an, numerous inks that we use. We use the traditional soot ink, 
this one is Iranian. There's been development in some calligraphers, uh, modern calligraphers are pre uh, preferring Japanese inks or uh, acrylic inks, which are um, aero colors, etc. We have a variety of knives. This is your traditional knife that um, was used previously. But uh, some calligraphers, for convenience, are preferring uh, modern craft knives or even scalpels. Yeah, scalpels. We have something called the, cho um, the makta, which is the chopping board for a column. Well, and I'll show you how you use it. So if we take um, the column and, uh, and show you how you prepare a column, we normally take the thinner end of the column. You'll take the thinner end. Preference is to work uh, cut through where the lighter side of the column is. There, there's variation. Sometimes calligraphers will use three, three fingertips or two, depending. But you want, what you want to do is you want to move away from the bulge. There's a knot on either end of the column. And that we want to get rid of because um, it will affect the writing. <coughs> so the groove you cut through, approximately three fingers, but to take it nice and slow uh, to control <coughs> the amount you're taking away. shave away until you come to the almond shape that's inside the column that's here. <coughs> and this is known as the face of the column. Then we shape, um, shape the sides to uh, which are the shoulders or the neck of the column to the desired width. you want to um, rest the column against the, the palm, uh, uh, against your thumb and push against with the knife. There's variations in how calligraphers are cutting but in the end it's something that you're comfortable with. So we want to slowly and surely cut away um, the column but also making sure that it's an equal cut on either side. <coughs> the balance of the pattern. Once we have um, the de uh, this desired width that we want, and the width depends on the script that you're writing, and also your own preference, uh, depending on the composition that you'll be writing. So for example, the fuller script would be a larger nib, and the Nessie script would be a smaller script, and the column would be, um, the, it, it would be a lot smaller, so one millimeter to two millimeters at the most, and or even smaller and the fuller is about four millimeters to begin with and then if you go any bigger it changes the dimensions to a larger fuller. <coughs> okay. 
So once we're happy with that, we want to use a matta, a strong board, or first take away the, the bulge. depends on your hand as well. Um, sorry, it's about 45 uh, degrees cut, but then you change it depending on uh, uh, the, the comfortableness in your hands. And it could be, for example, with me, Hassan Hodja asked to see two of my fingers and then he cut it according to the angle of my fingers. Um, so to begin with, I would say start with a 45 uh, degree angle cut. And then afterwards, you can uh, see what is suitable for you, for your hand. You cut in the, the slit in the middle, about two thirds of the color. And that is your. Uh, <coughs> so I would use this um, for practice with the fuller thread. If I wanted to go with Nessie, I would just really uh, take it down further, either side. This is for smaller scripts. And again, make sure that the script is in the middle. The length of the column, uh, it really depends also on your hands. Some, some prefer a roughly around 16 centimeters, <coughs> others the span of your hand. Because it's whatever um, is comfortable. If it's too long, it will knock into you. So this is a roughly a good length to have your column. So once you have your, your column cut and ready, you're ready to write, it's important to have a, a clean cut because it, uh, it won't affect your writing. And that's really the uh, uh, simple way to cut the column. And if I can go back to the presentation, please, then I can show you some of the scripts that this, uh, a very cheap way of making a column we can produce with our masterpieces. <coughs>
So here we have tools and tools from the Ottoman period, um, just a glance at how they, uh, they took pride in the, the tools that they were making. And they were almost, uh, they were like art pieces in themselves. We have some Ottoman uh, knives and mitre columns. We have the uh, ink well with the container. In a uh, storage um, container, brass, um, ink pot. This is um, a photograph of Hassan Hoja holding the, the column. So the ideal position to hold the column is between your knuckles and your forefinger. But also, again, it, it, it will vary slightly once you start writing and, and see what is comfortable for you. So once we have, we have this cheap uh, way of making some great tools, and then we're able to produce some really uh, magnificent, magnificent artwork. This is from Sheikh Hamdullah, who was the pioneering master for the Ottoman school, who um, really took the calligraphy to new heights. It's two different styles here. The Turki, Perki and Rika, which aren't used anymore, but they're part of the six scripts that um, were developed and favored in, in the early times. We have a piece by Hassan Hoja. It's Tulaf, or Tulaf in Turkish. Uh, Nash, Nessie. The two combined uh, in the Heya Sharif, which is the description of the Prophet. The Muhakkak, in, again, it's a different script, mainly popular for the Basmala Sharif. And uh, we have Talik, which isn't part of the sixth script, but it developed. It was an offshoot from the six scripts that uh, were popular. Divani was an Ottoman script that was developed. <coughs> and Rika, which is a, a handwriting script. So we can, you know, th these are just some examples of how um, you can create something <coughs> based on your hand and be able to produce some beautiful artworks. And, and how that is produced, I'll pass it on to Nuria, who will be able to demonstrate to you um, some of the beauty that comes out when you're writing it. Okay. Okay. And I would like to say, well, thank you very much uh, to Golnas for, for arranging all of this and, and, and having me here coinciding with um, a course I've been giving at the Princess School. So if I don't make a lot of sense, please forgive me. It's been a long day teaching. Um, some of the things that I, I wanted to just uh, remark about the, the materials that she's very well described is that uh, traditionally, even though she said it's an inexpensive, or she said cheap, but let's say inexpensive, uh, this, this reed column, which comes from the region of Dasfur in Iran, it's something which they would cut the column and then they would bury it for four years before using it. Uh, so they would they would bury it under horse manure because it has a special uh, chemical component called uh, I think in English it's ta uh, tannin. In English, <coughs> proper way you you pronounce it, but it's something that makes it harder. And then this column slowly throughout the ages will become something that the the calligrapher will cut in the same in the way she demonstrated very ergo ergonomically, you know, according to your hand, uh, how big your hand is, you know, what the angle of the fingers that she explained and so on. And it's beautiful to see how all the, all these uh, materials come from nature and they will all return to nature eventually. Yeah, so even though calligraphers are using some of the more chemical uh, inks now, you know, for special effects, it's also easier to find. Um, Really, if you the, the traditional materials, when you use the traditional materials, you feel there's a special baraka, there's a special presence, a special energy, however you want to describe it, that makes your writing come alive in a way that is uh, quite um, 
quite special, no? like any of the other traditional arts that we may see in Chinese calligraphy or Hebrew calligraphy or even in the Latin, Latin script. So um, another thing I wanted to say about the ink is that traditionally in, in Istanbul, if you travel to Istanbul and you see these beautiful mosques with all the lamps, uh, the lamps used to be made with, um, lit with oil, they were oil lamps, and the soot that would collect around the lamps was what, what was taken by the calligraphers and then ground to make the ink to write uh, these beautiful pieces that she has shown. So again, you see the, the sort of integration of everything, you know, you have the, the suit that's impregnated with the prayers of the believers take, being taken, ground up, and then used to write the sacred word. Uh, normally a sacred word or mystical <coughs> poetry or the different texts that would be written by the calligraphers. So um, nowadays, unfortunately, electricity <laughs> has come up and, you know, we're not so lucky to have these, but we still have uh, you know, some people making their own inks and, and selling them and so on. Um, another thing, uh, you didn't mention the paper, right? Okay. So that's, that's, that's what I'm going to do. So uh, the column, because it's a hard, uh, it's a hard uh, read, let's say, relatively hard, uh, because a lot of students ask me, uh, why don't we use metal? to write, uh, because it's more practical, you don't have to cut it all this long process. But actually, um, this is much more flexible, it's a soft feel, it glides very well on the paper, and you can alter the size the way she showed, so you can write many, many different uh, sizes, many different scripts with the same column if you so wish. Usually calligraphers, we have like 30 columns <laughs> for each different thing, but I mean, the, the potential is there, you know, one column can be for many different sizes. Um, and then contrary to what some people think, I think influenced by the exposure uh, to Chinese calligraphy and so on, where we have these thin papers, in, in uh, Islamic calligraphy, Ottoman calligraphy, we have um, a paper which is coated, meaning we want to have a sealed surface so the column is gliding <coughs> on this surface. When you look at Chinese calligraphy, you see this brush um, on a very porous paper. So when the brush moves, the ink is immediately absorbed. In, in um, Ottoman calligraphy, Islamic calligraphy, I'll use the word Islamic because it's more broad. Yeah, it, it takes all the calligraphy that we see in the entire Muslim world. Um, we want the column, actually, oh, so we want it to, to glide. Oh, there's, there's the delay. What? We want it to glide in the paper, and then we will also be able to scratch little imperfections. We will, able, we will be able to erase. And all this different coating is what we call the ahar paper. This coating, we're not going to go into the details here. It would be the subject of a whole day demonstration. but. Traditionally, um, the paper would be coated with different layers of starch, wheat starch, corn starch, um, and then um, with different ingredients such as gelatin, gum arabic, and so on, to make this sort of um, a little bit like a glue on top of the paper. And also other coats with egg white and alum, which would also add, we would do layer after layer, and then burnishing the paper to make it very, very flat, very shiny, you know, at the perfect surface, so when you're writing, there are no bumps on the road, and you just have this perfect flat surface that you can glide across. The equivalent today, uh, the modern equivalent that the students use is this sort of not very pretty, uh, glossy paper, yeah? But it's exactly the same concept. It's a paper that has been glossed over with these different coats, and traditionally, you would have the, the the, the persons making the ink for the calligraphers, the persons making paper for the calligraphers, and then the calligraphers would just go and buy it directly and use this for their, for their practice. Today I, I recommend all students of calligraphy to learn how to make their own paper because um, you understand very well um, how to use it and to, to... You need to be able to make it in order to understand how it behaves. 
with a color. So, um, again, this is just a very brief introduction to the, to the materials, a lot could be said, but um, we wanted to just give you, really, calligraphy is an ocean, and we wanted to just give you a little glimpse of, of, um, of this art from a more practical point of view. So we wanted to explain a few things um, about how, uh, let's say, the, the essential components of calligraphy, of Islamic calligraphy. And we can say that one of the essential components is the sense of proportion and harmony. And this proportion, which is uh, given to the letters, is um, it all stems from the knockdown. Where's the chart? So, um, actually. I'm just going to, that, to, for this initial explanation, I'm going to use a glossy paper. Um, so, similar to other scripts, like in um, Latin scripts and Hebrew scripts, they also use an octa measurement. We have... This is what we call nocta. Nocta in Arabic means uh, point. Mm -hmm. So because the kalam is, again, there's a, um, a delay with the camera, so I apologize. Um, the kalam is the first stroke that you can make. I, excuse me. The nocta is the first stroke that you make with a kalam. Because the kalam is not round, because it's cut at an angle, this creates this very square stroke, which is what we call a point. So it's not a round point, it's a square point. And depending on how big your column is, you're going to have different size nocta. So you can go as big or as small as you want. This nocta, is going to determine the size and the proportion of your letters. It's like you're measuring unit. So, I'm going to take another. So if I write, for instance, the first letter of the alphabet in a particular script called I think she mentioned it as well. I don't know how familiar you are, but there are diff many different styles. We call them scripts of calligraphy. So taking one of the, the scripts, which is very much used in the Ottoman school, and the Ottomans, they really uh, developed it to a very, very high level. So this is uh, Aleph, the first letter in the Thuluth style. So, sorry, I'm just going over because I'm. I you won't be able to see the, the light in So as you see this nocta as a unit measurement, and here I did a big example, but with this kalam, yeah, it's this one. It's our, our um, is a unit which is going to measure everything. So our first letter Aleph in this particular script measures eight noctas. Here, eight notas and a little bit. I went a little bit <laughs> over. Yeah, but this is our reference point. Then, so every letter has a standard measurement. And this is, as a student of calligraphy, this is what you study for many, many years. You study how to make the strokes and the proportions of the stroke. We have the nocta measurement, 
And then as the years go by, you start developing a sensitivity to the hair width measurement. Because we have, the way we measure, this is sort of a rough measure, and then we have the thickness of the strokes. We can have very thin strokes, or we can have thick strokes. Yeah, and this is where, here we're not going to measure with the nocta, we're, this is where the hair width comes in, and positioning the calam in the correct way. So the, the, the student of calligraphy will learn these two aspects, the proportion and the different angles of holding the calam. To continue in this um, style, after Aleph, we would go into Ba or Be in the Turkish. Do you have some black hair? This is oil and oil color. So here you see in the bottom, sorry, uh, on the right you see the letter with all the proportions given by the nocta, and then this is the letter by itself. Mm -hmm. So for years you study how to uh, proportion the letters, and then afterwards you start, um, you should be able to just write the letter without needing the, the noctas, yeah? Another, um, so she was mentioning the different scripts, just to give you a feeling, yeah, and just briefly. With the same kalam, if I were going to write uh, Nesich, which is the sister script of Thuluth, also widely written in the Turkish Ottoman school, we would, um, thank you so much. So instead of so this is Tuluth again to just review. You have the Tuluth Aleph. We compare it always to a standing person. And this would be your Nesif. So, actually a little bit higher. Yeah, so, in Nesif, the proportions are different. So the Aleph in Nesif will be five noctas. And the Aleph in Thuluth eight noctas. If I were going to do nas talik, or as the Turks say, talik, <coughs> style. I'm not a, a nas talik calligrapher, so it's not a perfect nas talik alif, but just to give you a, a sense, this would be three noctas. So every style, I'm just showing you with the first letter of the alphabet, every style would have a certain code uh, and a certain departure point, which will then influence all the other letters. So I like to think 
uh, when we talk about the family of the, the, let's say, the calligraphy forms that are used from the artistic point of view, um, it's very interesting because we have certain letters which are very linear. We can, let's say, uh, talk about the lines of certain letters. So obviously, Aleph is a linear letter. Ba, the letter I just did. It's a horizontal linear. And then we have curves. So here we go into the noon and all the letters that would be sharing this morphology. Inverse curves, and I'm doing sort of the representatives. Here we will have the letter G. And then we have letters that, I like to call them the hands and the feet. They're smaller letters that take up less space, such as wow, which is a beautiful, very, very symbolic letter, which you see everywhere in Istanbul. And the proportions of the wow. to go back and put the nocta so you see let's see the these different curves, inverse curves, normal curves. When we say normal, it's from right to left, because that's the way it is written. The more linear and then the smaller uh, letters are all the, the elements that we use as calligraphers to make these compositions and to bring them together. You start always with uh, more linear sentences, and then you would go into more complex compositions, and so on. So when you write on the on the traditional paper, uh, I don't know if you can see here, this traditional paper um, has been coated with all these different um, layers we were talking about earlier, the, the starch, the egg white mixed with alum, and so on. And then, because we burnish it, they add some, um, a little bit of soap grease, so you can burnish the paper. So before writing, always we need to get rid of this thin layer of grease that's on top of the paper. And To get rid of it. Okay. 
So a calligrapher would uh, typically warm up his hand beforehand and then uh, start writing. But I haven't really warmed up uh, enough. But. Which is a very interesting Turkish word that means nothing, but um, it's not nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's a very, very symbolic, um, symbolic word, referring to sort of emptying the ego in order to. So if I was going to write the same thing in message, just to give you a... Actually, I'll use the same column and then you can... Actually, I'm saying that upside down, you can't really appreciate the differences. Um, it's mainly the difference is in the proportion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the same column, but um, if you've noticed in the examples that she showed, when you had the two styles, Thuluth and Nese, Thuluth actually means three, three times or three-thirds, but uh, there's a debate about this, but um, usually we would write uh, the thuluth with one column and the nesik with a column which would be three times smaller. Here I did it with the same one just so you see how the, the proportions can alter so much from one script to the other. So if I was going to take <coughs>
this would be, let's say, the correct relationship for a calligraphy piece. You would have the Thuluth written with a column three times bigger, and then essay written with a column three times smaller. So um, I don't know if there are comments. I mean, we wanted this to be a little bit of a discussion as well. So if you, you know, this has been a very, very brief introduction. Um, just a little bit of a, a drop of the ocean of calligraphy. Um, I also, I want to mention that this tradition is very much alive. It's not something that's dying out and sort of uh, in a state of decay. Quite the contrary, it's something which is I would say it's being revived, encouraged. It's very, very active in Istanbul and all over the world now, really. Uh, we have the, the Turkish tradition. We have the, the Arabic, Arabic uh, calligraphy school, the Persian Arabic school, the Pakistani hut. So really, it's, um, it's wonderful to see how in the world we live in, where everything is being so driven by technology, there's also sort of a contrary movement as well to, to go back to the traditional arts and and we have some really wonderful masters who, who have been so generous to, to teach us and to who continue to transmit their art. So um, we just wanted to give you this very brief taste as to the, the, the materials, the, a little bit of the, what's involved in, in writing. If you have any questions or comments? <coughs> yes. Um, I'm a student at PCA, yes. and one of the things is that they're teaching us traditional arts, and it's really about understanding how things were done and sticking to the original brief, so to speak. Yes. Um, but I get the sense with calligraphy that, that it's a little bit more open. You're taught the proportions, you're taught the rules, but then your own sort of interpretation is still considered valid within, I assume, certain constraints. Yeah, like, um, that's I, a, it's a very important question, and we, we touched on it on Wednesday, where we, sorry, we had another talk on Wednesday. Um, you can definitely be extremely creative in calligraphy, but the most important thing is that you need to have a whole period I mean, this hitch that I wrote is very important. I mean, you really have to empty yourself in order to receive. So you have to absorb the aesthetic. You have to learn the proportions of the letters. You have to train your hand uh, to do the correct proportions. You are adhering to a very concrete example from 18th century Shefki Effendi and your teacher's examples. And after many years of training that you've sort of absorbed this aesthetic, then you can try to have your own personal, like when, when I say personal, it's a very dangerous term, huh? because I mean, semi-personal interpretation of the letters. You can add some tiny little stylistic things, you know, some, some calligraphers, they like to do the zulfa like this, or maybe a little bit like this, but I mean, we're talking about minute details that people who are not calligraphers, they wouldn't be able to distinguish. On the other hand, when she touched on the on the the, the sort of um, these new aerocolor schmink acrylic inks, obviously calligraphers they are experimenting with materials and with color, making some compositions which are maybe a little bit more minimalistic, but never ever altering the proportions of the letters and the shape of the letters at the because. The premise is, these letters have been developed for hundreds of years, you know, from the school of Baghdad to the Ottomans, when we talk about the Thuluth script, um, to a degree of perfection that who am I now to say no, actually, Aleph shouldn't be like this, it should be like this, you see? But we have painters who are not calligraphers from what we call the Kurufia school, and they're very happy to experiment and twist the aleph <laughs> and make different um, experiments. And, but it's no longer classical calligraphy. <coughs> it's Kurufia painting 
contemporary art, yeah, which is, I, I'm not condemning it. I mean, it's it's a valid possibility for an artist. But if you're a classical calligraphy, a, a classical calligrapher, you have that responsibility towards your art, towards your teachers, and towards the hundreds of years when she showed the silsila. I mean, you get the feeling of you know where we're coming from. You have that responsibility to honor it, and especially in the world we live in, to try to preserve it. You know, so so that's. Uh, so a there's, there's a real distinction between uh, the, the calligrapher and the, the person who paints using Yes, there's letters. a huge, huge distinction. And I think that the, the people who don't make the distinction are the Westerners who get very confused because they just call everybody a calligrapher. Mm -hmm. But when you speak to the Arab painters or the Iranian painters who are using calligraphy motifs and some of the Turkish painters also, there's some very uh, important contemporary painters who use letters. Uh, they don't say they're calligraphers, they say, I'm a painter, and I use letters in my paintings. Yeah, but the classical calligraphers always insist on having, um, on respecting these proportions, these nocta measurements that we've briefly, very briefly touched upon, and um, these proportions. Yeah. Yes. How long would a handmaid read column last, and do you always use just one column, even if it's a long inscription? Uh-huh. Do you want to answer that? Um, it, it depends. Um, so we're talking about two different uh, compositions. Well, if you were to do a you would stick to the same colour and, and try to work with it. Because a slight change in the cut or alteration will change the size of it. So you, you want to have a colour that, you know, that is strong and good from the beginning. With Nessie, um, if you use one of these colours, the, the nib tends to wear down quickly, so you have to be very careful with it. So for that reason, uh, calligraphers often choose to write with the um, Java colour because it's a lot more stronger and sturdier. So for example, if you were to write the, a page of the Quran, you'd probably get through the same uh, page with, without having to cut it. And then if you cut it slightly, it will be on the second page if it alters the size. But also, I think at, at that stage, you're so trained because of the years of practicing, the, the cuts are almost exact. So you, you can put, finish it with the same piece with the same color without having to uh, swap around different colors. Um, I, can, I can see that, apart from the technical side of uh, calligraphy, like the proportion and stuff, there's quite a strong philosoph philosophical side of, uh, for it as well. Mm -hmm. So the students of calligraphy, how much time do they spend learning the actual philosophy rather than the, the te technicality of, of uh, script? Yeah, ra rather than the philosophy, I would say it's just uh, it's integrated in the, in the way that you're taught. So, uh, again, we spoke about this the other day, but uh, it's, um, it's a method where it's completely based on the master-student relationship and um, it's one-to-one, -one, and it requires a lot of discipline, perseverance, and so on, because it's a very slow method where the master, um, the, the student writes one lesson after another, and the master will either pass them or not pass them on a lesson in order to progress. So every person will progress according to their patience, capability, uh, and so on. We have maybe a student who's very um, talented, but the master will purposely make them progress more slowly to make them more patient. And then you have other people who are maybe not so uh, gifted, but they will sort of have more of a steady, you know, they're very hardworking, very disciplined, and they will progress more quickly. So the master is always working with the student to, to cut basically to cultivate the virtues of patience, discipline, perseverance, and so on. So it's not really a philosophy, it's more of a, a you're learning um, a way of behaving and a way of respecting your art. And um, it's very much integrated into, into the spiritual universe of calligraphy, especially the way it's taught in the Ottoman school. It's not so much so in the Arab uh, calligraphy nowadays, but um, we see this very much still today in Turkey, this, this uh, very strong traditional way of teaching which reinforces this uh, the spirituality 
Sorry, me again. Yes. <laughs> when you talk on Wednesday, you gave some examples of the Bismillah. Yes. A whole heap of really, really different ones. Yeah. And they're all really beautiful. And it was very obvious to look that you know there was a lot of skill involved. Mm -hmm. Me personally, the very last Bismillah that you showed absolutely blew me away. It was beautiful. Yeah, the 16th century. Yes. Absolutely gorgeous. <coughs> and not to negate any of the others by any means. So my question is, what makes one stand out and you and yourself did you find that the preparation you did maybe the state of mind you were in maybe a prayer you said beforehand do you find that that affects the <coughs> aesthetic do you find can you tell something even if you've written two things yeah. that are exactly the same yeah so this goes back to the notion of um, a very important notion that the Persians they call it the shan of a piece. So shan, it's like the makam of a piece. So if you're not a believer, I mean, think in terms of energy or the aura of a piece. Yeah. So it, there's a special presence that a piece can, may or may not have, and it's not something that you can will or you know meditate for two hours <laughs> before you write, so your piece will be you know full of shan and. No, it's, it's something that is completely, uh, the spirit of a piece, uh, it's not up to you. <laughs> so you can only, you can only try to, to have a, a good practice, to, to do things in the most correct way possible, to adhere to the, to the aesthetic uh, principles, because these aesthetic principles by nature are very beautiful and are full of shan already, you see? so. You try, I mean, hitch, we go back to the hitch, you know? You try to be the hitch so that the spirit will be in the writing. And again, it's not something that you can will to happen. It's either there or it's not. And we see it so clearly in the old pieces. I mean, we have some pieces like the piece I showed the other day, which they just, they, 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 they blow you away. Even for, for a non-trained eye, huh? it's very important, the shan, is something that can be perceived by someone who is not a calligrapher, but anybody who has some sort of sensitivity. So we might have a very uneducated person who has a very pure soul, and they're very, very sensitive to this intangible beauty. Or we may have another very uh, amazing musician or artist from another discipline who are also very attuned to these um, more subtle things, and, and they will immediately uh, see this. So when we, we look at calligraphy, we're not necessarily only looking at this technical aspect of perfect proportion, perfect shape, but also is, is the spirit there? No, and this is what makes the masterworks of the universe. I mean, you know, when you listen to Mozart or, I mean, I'm going back to, to music, no? there's some pieces that are just, they were inspired. And you can say inspired by the muses, or inspired by the divine, eh? this is all depending on your belief system, but there is a source of, um, of inspiration that we see in, in the masterworks. And, and again, uh, it's not up to us to, for it to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, I find the calligraphy, you see most of the used color is blue. And from what I hear, the blue color is the time my most expensive color. Mm -hmm. and, uh, how, how my to be honest, do you know about, about the blue? The, in the Ottoman period, it was mainly black, it was not mm -hmm. popular. Uh, you know, it's, it's black, that's, mm -hmm. that's from um, the sources that we have. Mm -hmm. And then they would use red, yellow, and white, these three other colors, and gold. Mm -hmm. The most popular was black. <coughs> because the, it, it wouldn't fade. And also, um, it, again, it, it, we, when we were taught, we were given stories. We don't have, sometimes I, I've heard stories from my master, but I can't actually document it. So for example, the black, uh, the, the Kaaba is the Nukta. So it's black, so the ink is black. You know, so you have some um, mystical stories that are associated with learning. And the white um, was used for the chapter headings in illuminated Qurans. But it, it's, um, as far as I know, and from the books that we've read, it's, it was black. Mm -hmm. 
and also for the durability because the black is something it's it's but we're talking about the, the soot from the candle mm -hmm. so it's something that has burned uh, it can, you know it's burned as much as it's ever gonna burn so <coughs> with the sunshine and so when it doesn't alter you always have this permanent uh, color but the blue I think it, it came from this um, grinding uh, I think I don't know what the name in English this uh, precious stone semi precious yeah. stone Lapis lazuli. Lapis, yeah. And that's so Italian. That was, it was so expensive. Yes. Yeah. yeah, because it's bright ground lapis lazuli, mm -hmm. which you see it in some of the sort of Ottoman uh, fermans. Mm -hmm. The fermans as well, you know, the, the very famous one with the, the, um, the Tura, the signature of Sultan Suleiman and so on. It's gold and blue. But that was lapis lazuli, which is very expensive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, they used it in miniature and so on. Also, the, in the examples that we've seen in Istanbul, so for example, the Sakif Sabanji Museum has a whole collection of Ottoman masterpieces, and mainly the text there is black. Mm -hmm. I don't remember seeing the details, but I think we can. Just uh, majority a few, <laughs> let's say, yeah, compared Yes. Would you say is is there any way this uh, Arabic calligraphy is uh, influenced the abstract paintings? I, I mean, uh, Picasso studied. Yes, the Turks it. always like this <laughs> quote of Picasso. <laughs> but I'm interested in abstract painting because when you look at this uh, Turkish architecture, uh, the minaret is very feminine yes. compared to other. Uh, that shows in the form of uh, calligraphy as well. Mm -hmm. So we call it Istahak. Yes. Yes. So I mean, it just because what you said, the Western artists. Uh, yes, they, I think they, they, I, I think that the Western artists they always had a great admiration because of this rigor of line. Yeah, the, 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 the it's it's really the the refinement of this art right. is so high. You know, and what we're talking about the hair width measurement that I think any um, any sort of talented artist can immediately appreciate the enormous potential uh, for artistic expression. Yeah, and also a lot of the Ottoman calligraphers were great painters as well. It sort of went hand in hand. I don't really talk about that very much, but it was um, they had a very well trained eye. So. Um, I found it very intrigued with the whole master-student relationship. Yes. How, how does that work? Nowadays? Yeah, you see, we didn't talk about that because um, Bilal, uh, what, what's the last name? Badat. Badat. He gave a lecture here about that okay. subject, so this is why we, <laughs> we kind of skip that one. Okay. <laughs> but I think um, the, 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 we, we had two different primary teachers. And in, in this is an element of the divine. So your teacher, depending on your personality, I found that I found the most of the teacher for me. So I was into the spiritual aspect of it. And whether I got my letters right or not, it wasn't really an issue because I was just happy <laughs> writing letters because I felt that whatever I was doing would be enough. And, and the whole process of writing your letters is also refining your soul. And so, so the person that I was when I started is, is a completely different person to uh, what I ended up because the, the, just as writing as many letters, I was also uh, clearing away a lot of clutter as well. And that was guided by my teacher. Yeah, so, he, so the dynamic that happens between your master, the letters and you um, is quite strong should you, you know, if that is your intention of, of doing it. And so we, we, you know, you go and find a master, you ask permission to, to be taught. So this is the real traditional way, and this is my story, and Maria has a great story as well. But So you go in search of a master, and you ask if you, they'll accept you, and, and if they do, then you start with this. Um, uh, we have this book here, and it, your, your relationship really is built around this book. And the first couple of years are really tough. And as Maria said, you know, 
uh, it, it's a very holistic approach. So your master will work with you and on your psychology. So if you're falling behind, or um, you know, they'll encourage you and give you um, some uh, motivation. So maybe I'll just get a few corrections. I mean, it doesn't doesn't mean that my work was great. It's just that my master felt that was enough for me at that stage. But if I got a whole load of cor corrections, it means that actually I can handle what he has given. So, so it's really also uh, they teach you ed etiquette. He taught me about uh, life lessons. He also taught me about um, the way to teach as well. So. So I'm very much of, you know, if you love it, you can do it, but it, it, it's a struggle. But um, it, so, so then you work through this, going back to the book, you work through this process of working through these stages, and then once your master feels that you're at a certain degree, he'll issue you with what's, what is called an ajazot, and that you copy another master's work. And, and here, the term copying isn't the same as copying in Western art, it's actually the closer you can get to the original shows your uh, talent uh, as much as you can, right in the hands of another calligrapher. And then afterwards your own nuances come out. So once that's, uh, he feels that there's a certain degree, that you've reached a certain degree of being able to uh, uh, carry this now. So the, so then he will authorize your ajaza. So what that in essence means that you have the permission to sign the work, to teach others, and then also issue the ajaza. So then with the chain, as I was saying at the beginning, probably not in so much detail, but the Ottoman school is going outside of Turkey. So we have the chain that <coughs> it's coming to England, it's in Spain and France. And Nuria, I think Nuria already issued it in Ijaza. So Nuria has a student has that and, and, and it will continue. And this is what is so fascinating about this tradition is that um, it, it helped preserve the Ottoman tradition and the teaching. And then it's gone on to being spread uh, elsewhere. So this, I mean, that's a very brief summary, but I mean, Nuria had hers. In, a completely different <coughs> teacher with a different personality, and and I think in in <laughs> in these steps you, you you have your primary master, and then you, you can also see other masters as well. But at the beginning, you're taught to stick with your one because of the differences in the house. Yeah, and, and we should mention also that in the traditional system, there's no monetary payment involved, so mm -hmm. you that really changes the relationship because you feel so grateful for whatever your teacher can give you. And you, your payment is just working really hard and trying to do everything that you need to do, you know, because you feel this sort of responsibility that you have to to pay them with your hard work and with your, the fact, for them the payment is that you will carry on the tradition. You okay. see, that's the, that's their payment. And for you it's, um, it's really, we, we cannot even quantify it, you know, how, how grateful we are for everything that you can us. Can I just ask about the book you just mentioned? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is um, it's a uh, master thesis from Mahmoud Shoki Fendi, and basically it's the curriculum that we use in Istanbul. The originals are in Takata Palace Library. And when you work through this book, you'll see that um, we just have a proportion system. Okay. And there's no written explanation. So the secrets, so to speak, of the, the calligraphy are in your master's hand. And they cannot always be explained. And sometimes the strokes can't be explained. You have to feel them. And that's when the practicing, when you practice, you learn, uh, you embed this knowledge in your hand. And so this is the idea of repetition, it's a good thing. You know, we constantly work through, we have single letters, then we work through combined less letters. Um, it goes on to... Um, to Kita 
formats which are layout, different layout designs and sentences, etc. So I think if you're very talented, you could probably go through this book quite quickly. But maybe a year. But always with a teacher. Always with a teacher. Yeah. 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 A couple of years? A couple of years. Yeah. Minimum. 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 Yeah. But it's relative to If you're talented, obviously. Not, not only no? talent in psychology as well. Hard work. Yeah. yeah. If, you, if you have to, for example, if you're, if you're naturally disciplined to have good concentration, discipline, focus, and patience, you're going to go through it quickly. Mm -hmm. But if you have to acquire those and learn those, then it's going to take longer. It's again, it's very much like learning a musical instrument, a classical, like learning how to play the violin, mm -hmm. you know, it just takes daily practice, repetition, a lot of self-discipline. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, do you have to know uh, how to play with your vocals to know this part? No, 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 not at all, because for instance, I, I have a, a basic knowledge of Arabic and Turkish I learned when I went to Istanbul and I learned the modern Turkish. And a lot of the, the students in Turkey, they don't know Osman Lijab, they don't know Ottoman Turkish. Um, many of them don't know Arabic because, you know, with the changing of the alphabet and, and the Turkish Republic, it's in a little bit cut off. So, um, sometimes it can be an advantage because you approach calligraphy as calligraphic forms and you're just seeing the beauty of the shapes mm -hmm. instead of reading it. I have some, I have Arabic students who are so conditioned mm -hmm. by, by the shapes. I have a lot of North African students. I, I live in Paris and I have a lot of Algerians, second generation Algerians, Moroccans. And I will teach them, you know, the Thulu scene, for example, and they will go back into a Maghrebi scene. You know, mm -hmm. like, it's in their DNA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they're so used to just their handwriting. So when you have someone who's tabula rasa, who knows nothing, um, they will actually, again, the huge notion, <laughs> they're more empty, so they're more, they just focus on these shapes. Later on, of course, knowing Arabic can be a great help, because you don't want to make mistakes when you're writing, you need to have always uh, somebody proofreading for you, I mean, it's, uh, as a professional calligrapher, it can definitely, uh, it can only help, but... As a student, it's not necessary at all. And, and the method of instruction is not necessary at all. It's purely um, aesthetic. Mm 